for God's love this morning say hallelujah. hallelujah hallelujah wonderful praise the Lord thank you for being here today at Kingsland Baptist Church where we are here to sing of God's amazing awesome love and if there's one thing that really gets us charged up I, well, there's a lot of things that gets us charged up but one of them is babies and uh, we are going to dedicate a baby here in just a minute I want to read a scripture to you that should mean something to you from from the book of Samuel you remember Samuel's mama wanted a baby bad Hannah wanted a baby in Samuel 1, verse 11, she made a vow. She pleaded before the Lord. She said, Lord of hosts, if you will take notice 
of your servant and remember not to forget me and give your servant a son. I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and his hair will never be cut. She'd never had a baby and she wanted a boy and God gave her one. In in 1 Samuel uh, 1 verse 27, she's returning him back to Samuel, the prophet. And she said, I prayed for this boy and since the Lord gave me what I asked him for, I now give the boy to the Lord. For as long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. Then he bowed and worshiped the Lord there. So today, we're going to dedicate little baby Everett. And I know that Tanner and Michelle uh, believe that he is just a gift from God. And um, the families are all here today. Family, raise your hands so we can recognize you. Thank you all for being here with them. Tanner and Michelle, come on up. Let's, I got something for you here. It's a cute little baby boy Bible here. We have all of ours from all three of ours. Keep on, hold on to that. Here's a little certificate. It says Everett Michael Daniel. That's in there, so you can hold on to that, Dad. And um, church, we're going to have to sacrifice. We're going to have to work. We, every time we dedicate a baby, we're reminded of, of all that we're going to have to do, the sacrifices we're going to have to make, and, and just the extreme amount of effort it takes to raising a baby. I saw on Facebook a message from um, a, a, another mommy in our church who said her baby was up all night long. And the other one, their other child got up first thing in the morning, and then it said, they had this beautiful picture of this baby there, and it said, but I love her anyway. And uh, she knows who she is. <laughs> She's here. But, um, but they take a lot of work, and, and they make cute little messes, and, and you got to clean them up. And, and we got to buy playground equipment and gymnasiums that cost like a million and a half dollars and all that kind of stuff, okay? So... If we're going to reach the children, we're going to have to continue to make tremendous sacrifices to make that happen. So Kingsland, let me ask you afresh, will you dedicate yourself to doing everything necessary to reach the next generation in this church? Why don't you just raise your hand and say amen. Okay, I know you will. Amen, yes. And, 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 but for today, more than, than, ever can't make a whole lot of decisions on his, on his own. He's a smart looking little guy there though, isn't he? Um, But more than him, Tanner and Michelle, Will you dedicate yourself to bringing him up in a godly home, bringing him up in a, in a home where he's in church, where he's being taught the Word of God, and where he can grow into the, the man of God that God wants him to be? Will you dedicate yourself to that today? Family, let's pray together as we dedicate this little boy to Jesus. Lord, we thank you for Everett. And Lord, I thank you that um, you made him just perfect. He's just such a beautiful little boy, and we're so thankful for him and his big sister here. Lord, I pray that you would bless him. We pray blessings on him today. We pray for health. We pray for wisdom. We pray for Holy Spirit anointing on this little boy that you would touch him. And in the same way that little Samuel was dedicated to the prophet Eli, really being dedicated to the Lord by his mama, Lord, I know Tanner and Michelle today are dedicating him to you for your service, for your will to be done. But Lord, I pray that you would bless them, that they would bring him up in the training, in the admonition of the Lord, that he would find you and know you and seek after you and serve you all the days of his life. We dedicate him to you. We pray blessings on this family. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Good job, Tanner. Michelle, we're so thankful for you and proud of you. At this time, I want to ask Pastor Derek to come, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about Fusion Mission Camp. Yes, Fusion Mission Camp. Three weeks from today, we will be flooded with teenagers all over this campus. We will be hosting about 300 students in our church facilities. They will not all be housed here. Uh, We will be housing about 100 to 125 of those students all over our campus. And this is not a our youth group thing. This is teenagers from all over the state of Virginia that are gonna be coming here to serve the city of Richmond through mission projects. Um, And not just any mission projects. It's not just, hey, let's go out and feed people and give people money or whatever. It's actually going to be done through local churches in our community so that there's a connection with a local church so that when people accept Jesus, they have a local church that will follow up on them so that when we do projects in a community, we can tie that back to a local church so that people get involved, um, so that people can be reached out to from those local churches. And it's just going to be a really, really great time and a great week of ministry, and I'm really excited about what God is going to do there. But I'm going to emphasize a word here that we're going to have to really emphasize during that week, and that is flexibility. We're going to have to be very, very flexible on our campus. Um, Our campus may not 
you know, when you get our group of teenagers on a Wednesday night can do a lot of damage to Cher Hall and the way it looks after they leave. There's cleanup that's involved after they're gone. And 300 students on our campus, I'm just going to tell you that probably not everything is going to look neat and tidy if you show up during the week. There will be some, some work that needs to be done and we need help with that. That's not something that just our leaders or these leaders from other churches can do. And so we have many, many needs, many different ways that you can get involved. Some of you work. You can come in the evenings and serve during the evenings after work if you want. If you work in the evenings, you can come and serve sometime during the day during that week. But we need people to work with Kenny on security. We need people who are willing to get here really, really early and make breakfast for 125 teenagers, pack lunches for 125 teenagers. We need people who are willing to just come here and work the lobby, work the guest registration, answer questions when people ask where's the bathroom and things like that uh, during each evening service. We are probably going to need childcare during the evening service for our workers who have children. So there are many different ways that you can get involved. And uh, if you would like to get involved with that, we've already had several people sign up for that. But if you would like to get involved, you can see me anytime, talk to me anytime over the next couple of days. Next week, we will actually be passing a sign-up sheet around where you can put your name and phone number on there and the different areas that you could possibly serve in. And we would just love for you to help out with that. It's going to be a great ministry. You will have the privilege of ministering to teenagers, not just from our church, but teenagers all over the state of Virginia as they go out and minister to our community. And they're even gonna be doing work connected with Kingsland. They will be in return helping our church out as well. So I hope that you will consider that, make that a priority. That will start three weeks from today, June 23rd, around 5 p.m. or so. Let's pray and we'll continue worshiping. Lord, thank you so much for just the opportunity to come and worship you and to get into your word and learn what you want us to learn. And I pray that you would speak through the music, that you would speak through Pastor Pat, these wouldn't just be messages that we listen to and think, oh, that was a good message or that was a good song, but that these would be things that we apply to our lives, that they would be life-changing, and that you would have freedom to move in our hearts and change our hearts and change our lives. Today. In your name I pray. Amen. You can stand and we'll continue worshiping.
Father, we lift you up this morning, Lord. Cleanse our hearts. Open them up to you, Lord. We just, we just praise you for each and everything, for the gift of life, Lord, that would allow us to share Christ with those we come in contact with, Lord. Now as we bring before you this offering, Lord, take it with a willing heart through us, Lord, and a giving heart through us, Lord, that we give back that which is yours. Use it to build thy kingdom in your heavenly name. Standing at my window, hidden by the night, harboring the private wounds, safe and out of sight. There's an agony in living, but there's a comfort in truth, and no one knows my heart. The sanguine act of mine, guarded by the eloquence I sometimes hide behind. But it's a veil of false pretenses that you can't see right through, because no one knows my heart better than you. Thank you, Mary Jo Fjordelis, for reminding us of that truth, that God knows our hearts. And we start, started that last week, Mark chapter 4. You can go ahead there if you want. Talking about the heart of mankind. And uh, what is your heart? Is it the hard heart, the shallow heart, the crowded heart, or the fruitful heart that we talked about last week? And we'll be talking about that again in just a minute. You see the kid zone's been dismissed. Let me, before I get started, let me direct your attention to your bulletin which um, I don't want to bore you with all reading the bulletin to you, but I wrote a little letter in there that I'd like you to read. And there's an insert in the bulletin, uh, uh, which is really a flyer for you to hand out to a friend or neighbor. We talked about this last week, that on um, Wednesday night, we're starting our summer of revival. To be honest with you, I would love for God to start the revival today, right now. So we're praying for God to anoint us to do great things in the life of our church this summer. And um, now we also recognize that you're going on vacation Go on your vacation. Enjoy your vacation. Just remember us when you go. Pray for us. You can watch us on live stream while you're gone if you want to. But um, rest. Enjoy your summer. Kick back. If a lot of us will participate with this fusion camp that Derek was pushing just a few minutes ago, it'll be easy. If only a handful do, it will be the worst week of their lives. So don't do that to them. Let a lot of people help, and uh, it'll, it'll be easy. 
but um, tonight we have a church council at 5 o'clock. We have our business meeting at 6.30. Got a lot of good information to share tonight. You'll want to be here for that. And if you're a member of our church, you need to be here. And uh, Mary Jo just sang, so you see in the bulletin there her pretty little picture. And um, she's our intern this summer, so you can find out all about her uh, on that little thing there. She's a senior at Liberty, and she's going to be working with us for the next 10 weeks. Um, this afternoon, after the service, you can pick up visits for Go Outreach in Sharer Hall. There's no lunch. There's not a lot of stuff going on. Just pick up some visits, pick up some flyers about the church, and head out and make a couple of visits. And uh, we will go out again next month and probably go right back to Monroe Park because that was such an awesome, awesome experience. Um, also, on Wednesday nights, uh, you can sign up for the meal, which will take place at 545. And then the Crazy Love series is happening up in the balcony across from the meal. So we'll all be there. You can, you can uh, get the book. I have a bunch of the books right here. If you want to pick one up, I, have, I went out and got 10 more the other day. So there's 10 here. If you want to get one, you can, or you can just go to Lifeway and get it yourself. Uh, but we have 10 here that I'd really like to get rid of first. So come see me. Um, but that's Wednesday night. The, the youth are kicking off their summer program on Wednesday night. The children are starting Team Kid, the preschool uh, is starting kid style. So all that's happening this Wednesday night. And uh, we will be, the, the adults will be together praying for God to bring revival to our church. Going through crazy love, which as you can imagine, is talking about your love relationship, your intimate relationship with Christ and uh, the, the status of your heart. And, and um, it's, it's just really, really going to be a great summer. Next Sunday, Steve Freeman will be here in the morning and in the evening. So make plans to be here next Sunday morning and Sunday night. He's going to play his, on Sunday night. He's going to play the piano some. It's going to be a little bit of a different kind of thing. So you'll it, kind of a concert, I guess you could call it. Be here for that. The next Sunday on uh, June 16th on Father's Day, we have um, Rachel Rigdon, violinist, coming in. So you'll want to be here for that. And in your bulletin, you were given a little a little sign up deal that you can sign up for our first family fun night, which is on June 30th called Dinner and a Show. It's going to be a lot of fun, but we need to know that you're coming so we can prepare food for you. So sign, each individual person sign up and um, put your age there. It, it's, it's broad age ranges, so nobody's gonna be made uncomfortable there. Just check off your broad age range. And um, you can hand that in at the, the desk or if you'd like on your way out. The welcome desk can collect those for us. And um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So sign up, there'll be games, it'll be a really, really special night. And we'll tell you a little bit more about it next week. But, but uh, be thinking about that. Make plans to be here. And um, there's other things in here I'm missing. But read your bulletin. Do all the stuff that's in the bulletin, and it'll help you. Um, now, Mark chapter 4. Are you there? Last week we looked inward. Last week we looked inward into our hearts. This week we're going to look outward. This story has an inward aspect and an outward aspect. These, these stories about seed... And, and planting and farming and and uh, Mary Jo is from Iowa that's where my family my brother moved out a few years ago then my mom and dad moved out to Iowa and um, it man the the the, the, the cornfields are just vast miles and miles of cornfields those people know something about planting seed and bringing in a harvest I know next to nothing I should have had her come and give a talk on on corn it's amazing they have computers in their tractors these are not a bunch of hillbilly redneck farmer people okay? these are intelligent wealthy farmers that have computers on their tractors and they know how to plant the seed just right and 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 and, and, and dry the corn out and all that kind of stuff I on the other hand I don't even have a garden and uh, we probably should have one but we don't um, uh, one day maybe we'll get one but I remember when I was a kid my mother I, I could not wait to get my hands on the tiller remember y'all everybody have a tiller a big tiller and we start that thing up and tear up ground. And I was excited uh, that she finally let me till the garden, which was fun, a lot of fun. We had like a metal fence around it. I got the tiller caught in that metal fence. And, man, poles started coming up. I destroyed her whole fence trying, just trying to till the ground to make the garden. So I've had bad luck with, with gardening and, and, and planting and all that. I am not an expert on all this agriculture stuff. But if you go back 2,000 years ago to the, to the, 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 the the day of the days of the Bible, or just go back 100 or 200 years into our culture, and this was something they could relate to. Um, planting and, and, and sowing seed, and I um, titled the message this morning, Sowing the Seeds of Love. Sowing the Seeds of Love. And we talked last week about our heart, and I've talked about that already a little bit today. Uh, now let's go outward. Let's let, you know, the soil of your heart, what is the soil of your heart? 
and understand that when you cast seeds out, different people have a different heart condition. They're not all going to receive it the same way, are they? But in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 21, we're going to read this. We see that God is more interested in his kingdom than he is your comfort. God is more, and, and all of the seed planting stuff is about his kingdom. I'm going to define the kingdom. I'm going to talk more about the kingdom in just a minute. But suffice to say for now, God is way more interested about his kingdom than he is your conveniences, your comforts, your happiness. You know, the Bible is the story of God, not about you. You're involved. You're, you're part of it. But it's not, it's, it's found, it's not about us. Found, it's about him and his glory, and his honor, and his kingdom. He's concerned about that, and we should be concerned about that now and in the future. So let's read about this. In Mark chapter 4, starting verse 21, he said to them, Is a lamp brought in, in to be put under a basket or under a bed? Isn't it to be put on a lampstand? For nothing is concealed except to be revealed, and nothing hidden except to come to light. If anyone has ears to ear, he should listen. Then he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. By the measure you use, that we measured and added to you. For to the one who has, it will be given. The one who does not have, even what he has, will be taken away. The kingdom of God is like this, he said. A man scatters seed. Now put on your thinking caps. What is the seed from last week? Verse 4, it's the word of God. And he scatters seed on the ground. What is the ground? What is the soil? It's the heart of man. Back to verse 15. He sleeps and rises night and day in the seed sprouts and grows. He does not know how. The soil produces a crop by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the ripe grain on the head. But as soon as the crop is ready, he sends for the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, how can we illustrate the kingdom of God? Now, we've done seeds at the beginning, we've done seeds in the middle, we're doing more seeds, the mustard seed. He said, how can we illustrate the kingdom of God? Or what parable can we use to describe it? It's like a little tiny mustard seed that when sown in the soil is smaller than all the seeds on the ground. And when sown, it comes up and grows taller than all the vegetables and produces large branches so that the birds of the sky can nest in its shade. He would speak to the word to them in many parables like these as they were able to understand. And he did not speak to them without a parable. Privately, however, he would explain everything to his own disciples. On that day, when evening had come, he told them, let's cross over the other side of the lake. So they left the crowd and took him along since he was already in the boat, and the other boats were with him. A fierce windstorm arose, and waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. So they woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said, Silence, peace, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Imagine the look on the disciples' face at this point. Whoa! And he said to them, why are you fearful? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified. This is a holy reverence of God here, fear of God. And they asked one another, who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him, and so should we. Sowing the seeds of love in this text, how? How do we do that? I want to give you three action items of how to do that. And they are this. Light your candle, plant your seed, trust your Savior. That's the whole, the whole rest of the chapter in three little statements there. So let's, I'm going to say them and I'm going to have you say them with me again. Light your candle, plant your seed, trust your Savior. That's cheating. You're putting it up there where they can see it. Okay, let's do it together. Light your candle, plant your seed, trust your Savior. Light your candle by reflecting God's glory. We don't have any light of our own to offer. We don't have any special powers. God's glory reflects. And if you have a heart that's open to what he has for you, it will absorb it, and we can reflect it, and we can light our candle. And that's what these first verses are talking about. Light your candle. You remember that song, This Little Light of Mine? I'm going to let it shine. Remember that? Shine it. Let it shine till Jesus comes. Remember that verse? Let it shine till Jesus comes. That's actually appropriate to this text, because when we're talking about the kingdom... We're talking about a real kingdom. Jesus is going to come. If you're depressed, if you're hurting, if you're, if you're having a bad day, a bad week, a bad year, 
take heart, smile, peace, be still in your heart, knowing Jesus is going to come back. And our job is to light our candle and to reflect his glory, to proactively, intentionally reflect God's love and light at home, at work, at school, at the club, at the gym, at, on the ball field, at church, everywhere we go. I brought a picture with you, with me today, that is so important to me, I haven't even taken it out of its wrapper. I guess we just haven't matted it up yet and put it up, but it's, it's cool. I love this picture, I love this place. This is the Jupiter Inlet Lighthouse in Jupiter, Florida. Has anybody ever been to Jupiter, Florida? A few people have. Alan Jackson lives there. Um, they talk about, and Burt Reynolds. Is he still alive? He, if he's alive, he lives there. He has a house there. I hope he is. But anyway, we went up this lighthouse last year. We go there on vacation a lot. Elizabeth has family that lives down there. Her aunt Pat, awesome, awesome lady. Um, we share a name. And we love going down there. And for the first time, I've seen this lighthouse for many times, many years, 13, 15 years, I've seen this lighthouse where we went on our honeymoon, Jupiter Beach. We walked up that puppy. And let me tell you, it was a long, hard, scary walk, walking up that lighthouse. And it was, the view was beautiful, but I was, I was not comfortable up there. It's way up high. And it's still in a, a functioning, it still works. And it's just that beautiful in real life. I don't know how many lives that lighthouse saved, but we all know the purpose of a lighthouse, right? We know why it was there. And in a sense, we as Christians, as followers of Christ, we shine our light. We reflect God's light. And there is a sense of danger. There is a real danger that we are, we are shining our light. We're to be a living lighthouse. You see, the teaching of Jesus was never intended to be just for an inner circle of followers. It was and is the responsibility of disciples to communicate to everybody. Look back at verse 24. He said to them, pay attention to what you hear. By the measure you use, it will be measured and added to you. For the one who has, it will be given. And for the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Doesn't that sound harsh? Doesn't it? You are responsible for what you've been taught. Pay attention. God will hold you accountable for what you do with what you know. Think about that. You are blessed to sit under the teaching of the Word of God. Hopefully this morning you came at 9.30 and you went to a classroom and you discussed the Word of God. That's a blessing to have it in your hands. A lot of people don't even have it. They don't even know who Jesus is. They've never even heard the gospel. That's why we need to light our candle all over the world and shine the light of Jesus where, where it's never been shown before, but... You're responsible. You've been given the light. And the more light you've been given, the more responsible you are. God will hold you accountable for that. And you realize the more you give, the more you plant, the more you sow, the more you share, the more God will give back to you. And if you reject the light or if you hide the light, it will cost you. I think that's what, those, I think that's what Jesus meant in those verses. Light your candle by reflecting God's glory. Secondly, plant your seed by sharing God's word, spreading God's word, sowing God's word, however you want to say it. And you see those two stories, similar message, both stories. I think they clarify that the parable of the sower and the seed was referring to the establishment and the expansion of God's kingdom. Just a little mustard seed that grows into a big, big bush or tree. Little tiny seeds are planted in the ground, and three out of the four don't make it. Some get on hard ground. Remember the hard ground, the hard heart, the, the shallow, the, the crowded part? But some of the seed do take root, and they produce an amazing kingdom harvest. So what is our job? Well, the seed has been planted in your heart. Now it's your job to plant the seed in other people's hearts. And God is more interested in his kingdom than he is your comfort. I tried to plant a little seed yesterday, and do you know what? My wife can tell you it was scary. I invited someone to church yesterday. Did you invite anybody to church this week? I want to encourage you to do that. But even as the pastor of the church, I'd been thinking about this person, and I told them, I've been wanting to ask you about something. And I, but I got a little, you know, it, it, what if they turn me down? What if they laugh at me? What if they think Baptists are crazy? What if they don't come? You know, all the stuff that goes through our minds. And that's a very small seed to plant, but 
It's, it's a seed you can plant. It's a seed I can plant. Plant your, your seed by sharing God's word. And God is more interested in the kingdom than he is us being comfortable or never being in awkward situations or never taking a chance or never, never making an effort. And, and, and there's so many different ways we can make an effort to, 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 to plant seed. But make no mistake about it, it's never going to be convenient. It's never going to be easy. It's never going to be, it's never just going to fall in your lap. You're going to have to be proactive about it. The kingdom. Let's define the kingdom. kingdom. And I'm going to use John MacArthur's definition of the kingdom here. God's sovereign rule over the sphere of salvation at present in the hearts of his people and in the future in a literal earthly kingdom. Okay, let's all repeat that. Just kidding. I should have put it on the PowerPoint. I'm sorry. God's sovereign rule over the sphere of salvation at present time in the hearts of people. Remember Luke chapter 17, 21. The kingdom of God is within you. So there was an immediate, I believe Christ on earth was offering his kingdom. And he said, the kingdom is in you. It's in your hearts. So there's a current, present, immediate sense of God's kingdom from then till now in our hearts. But also in, in the future, literal, earthly kingdom. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a physical, literal, 1,000-year kingdom. Where would I come up with some crazy idea like that? Well, go over to Revelation chapter 20 together. Let's go. Revelation chapter 20. I want to encourage you this morning a little bit. Every time God asks us to do something, every time God asks us to shine our light, to plant our seed, every time we're, we're, last week was mostly inward, this week's mostly outward, but never fear, he's going to give you everything you need to get done what he wants you to get done. And we have the hope of heaven. But, but, but there, it's more than just this, this heaven. What, what is heaven? Well, Revelation 20 tells us a lot about it. it. tells us about a kingdom. Revelation 20, verse 1, I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. Now, that's kind of sad, tragic, apocalyptic language, but we should be pretty excited about that because Satan is destroying our planet. He hates us. He's going to be dealt with here. This is after Armageddon. He threw him into the abyss and closed it, and he put a seal on it so that he could no longer deceive the nations until 1,000 years were compiled after that, he must re be released for a short time. Very interesting. Why in the world did God let him back out? Or is he going to let him back out and deceive the nations and all that? But that's for another message. Verse 4. Then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of God's word, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads, or their heads. So we know this is talking about the end of times. We're talking about after the tribulation time. And they came to life and reign with the Messiah for 1,000 years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the 1,000 years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in this resurrection. The second death has no power over these, but they will be priests of God and the Messiah, and they will reign with him for 1,000 years. So there is a literal 1,000 year kingdom coming that, that in the Old Testament, the, the prophets prophesied about a kingdom and a Messiah. So the religious leaders and, and, and many of the people in Jesus' day did not recognize him, but if they had, they would have expected him to set up a literal physical kingdom, which he didn't do. Then, not a physical, literal kingdom, but a kingdom in their hearts. So let's look at the definition of the kingdom again. God's sovereign rule over the sphere of salvation at present in the hearts of his people and in the future, future in an earthly, literal kingdom. Here's the fact, folks. We are called to plant seed. We cannot make it grow or force results or, or make anything happen. We are used to plant kingdom seeds, and God does all the growing. Have you ever seen a farmer put something in the, a seed in the ground and then dig a little tunnel beside it and look at the seed as it was growing? I mean, do they even have that on National Geographic? They might, I don't know if they can do that. I doubt they can. It would mess up the seed. You can't see it. It's mysterious. It's, it, it says in the text that the farmers don't even really know how it works. They just know that it works. So we are seed planters, and we can't control. We're all, when, we, when we pass out the seed, someone's going to get a hard ground. Someone's going to get choked. But some of it's going to spring in the hearts of fruitful people that will bear, bear 30 and 60 and 100 fold, a kingdom harvest. Our Go Outreach today is an example of this. Go plant some seed. Just go tell somebody about Jesus. I was at the mall the other day, and if there's one thing I love about the mall, it's those people that stand out in front of the, um, the food court is the number one thing I love about the mall. And 
the people who stand out giving out food. What a great country we live in. Think about this. You walk into a mall, and they're giving you food on toothpicks. And my daughter and I went there the other day, and, and I ate somewhere. And, and, but you know what? There was still someone out there giving out chicken. And I was like, you know what? I really didn't want more. I wanted to talk to the lady because I saw her giving out all these chickens. Have I already told them about this? I wanted to tell you all about this last week. I'm sorry. But this happened the week before last. So I asked her to go get that lady so we could talk. And, and, and so she did, but she came back with two toothpicks with chicken on them, which I ate. And, but the lady did come over, and I asked her. I said, I know that you've been passing out chicken. Does it, does it, does it ever bother? Because a lot of people just walked by and didn't want it, which I can't understand for the life of me. If someone's passing out chicken, take it and eat it and be happy. But, um, but more people than not said, no, I'm okay, that's all right. But, but she gave out all her chicken. Her last two little chickens was to us, which is also an illustration of this. More will be given that you need and all that kind of thing. But I, I interviewed her a little bit, and I said, you know, I'm a pastor, and I give out spiritual chicken. And, um, and she started talking to me about her life. In fact, I'll tell you what she said. Um, she said she grew up Catholic, but um, she was there, moved to Chesterfield. I was trying to get her to come to my church. In fact, I gave her a little thing with our, our church on, information on it, and I said, you don't have to take it. She said, okay, I'll take it, whatever. And uh, I hope she read it. But, but um, she said she came here, and, and they were looking for a church, and, and they went to... Um, I'll tell you what kind of church it was. It was a Unitarian church. Unitarians believe all religions are one, all gods are, are, are God, and, and everybody's you know, just fine, and, and, and they're way, way off. It's a cult, basically. And she said, but when I walked in there, I was, I, they hugged me, they greeted me, they were friendly to me, they loved me and my kids. It just broke my heart to hear that, to think, man, I wonder if there were any Bible preaching churches she visited. I wonder how she was greeted there. Why didn't she end up at one of them? And it made me think about us and how we, how we treat one another and how we greet people. But, but anyway, I tried to tell her about Jesus, which she wasn't going to get at her weird Unitarian church. And, um, but, but she told me she doesn't mind when people don't take the chicken. That's her job, is to just give out chicken. If they take it, they take it. If they don't, they don't. No big deal. And I thought about us. We're giving away something better than chicken, although the chicken she was giving away I think is the best chicken out there. But, but we're giving out something better even than that, the best chicken possible. We, we are dispersing. We are sharing. But most of us are so afraid. I mean, literally, when was the last time you stood in front of the mall passing out Bibles or telling people about Jesus? I mean, we don't do that. We'd probably get arrested. I, I don't think they would allow it. But why do we let ourselves get our feelings hurt so bad? Why are we so afraid to spread seed the, the girl at the chicken store didn't care. She just gave out chicken. And the people that wanted it took it. And the people that didn't want it, some of them weren't hungry yet. See, I ran into somebody two weeks ago that was extremely hungry for the gospel. And Pastor Derek and I prayed with him and led him to Christ. He was so hungry for the gospel. It was amazing. He sent me a text this week and told me he got baptized in the river. I'm excited about that. And when it's, when it's the, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will draw people to himself. God will draw people... When God's drawing them, man, you can't really mess it up. You might think, well, I'm not qualified. None of us are qualified. But when it's the right person, you can't hardly mess it up unless you really try. Are you kingdom-minded or survival-minded? Are you kingdom-minded or, or, I don't know, earthly-minded? Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Everything's going to be okay. Put the kingdom first. It's more important to God. He's more interested in his kingdom than he is your plans, your dreams, your ambitions. Plant seed. Plant seed. That's the application. Plant the seed. Apply this to your everyday life. Plant seeds of truth into your kids, into your grandkids. Plant seeds at work of the gospel. When you tithe, thank you, thank you, thank you to every one of you who tithe this morning to support all the ministries of this church. We were at Monroe Park giving away food and water and all that because you, you may not have physically been there, about 30 of us were, but you paid for that to happen. Donna Price told me this week um, when, when I was talking to her about the, today's, the nursing home. We're going to the nursing home today if you want to go with Donna. But she was, she was, she was bragging on my little boy David who at Monroe Park was giving away water to people. 
And one man said, hey, little man, can I have one of those? And he gave him the water. And then, and then David reached back, I guess, out of his pocket and pulled out a tract and gave it to that man. And Donna was just brought to tears by that, which doesn't take much. I mean, Donna's brought to tears easily. But it almost brought me to tears talking to her about it. I thought, man, that's awesome. I'm, my little boy planted a seed. He's six. You can plant a seed. But when you give money, you're, you're in, 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 in invest into the kingdom. When you hand out a flyer for this Wednesday night thing or send a text or a Facebook, something, plant some seed. Light your candle, plant your seed. In closing, trust your Savior. Trust your Savior by believing his promises. You've heard this story about Jesus sleeping in the boat. We've heard of it. Many of you have heard it all of your lives. We can trust him. Trust your Savior by believing by relying on his promises, by, by having confidence in his promises, especially in the storms. We can talk about metaphorical storms. I'll talk about that in just a second. But there are real storms hitting our country. Those folks in Oklahoma on Friday got hit again. And, um, man, can, we've been in, I remember in the hurricane and so forth. You're, just, you're scared. You're, your whole your house is going to get destroyed or, or what have you, your cars. I had a car destroyed in the last hurricane. Imagine if on, 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 on the news channels on Friday, if all of them had reported Jesus coming out of the sky, landing on the earth, and saying, peace be still, and it was done. I know those people would have loved that. You do realize Jesus doesn't always calm every storm immediately like this, does he? Christ had healed people, showing authority over sickness. He had cast out demons, showing authority over the spirit realm. But here he proves that he has authority over nature by calming the sea, and the disciples were absolutely blown away. <laughs> well, they were about to get blown away, and he calmed the storm, and they didn't. They were scared to death in that boat when the storm hit because they didn't understand that the one who created everything, who created the storm, who spoke this world into existence, he was in the, he was in the, in, in, in the stern sleeping. And we should trust the Lord that way. Before you work for God, remember how it all got started. Never forget where it all got started. It got started with childlike faith, trusting the one who created the world and could calm the sea. Trust him. Trust your Savior. The disciples thought they were going to die. They were in big-time trouble, and they questioned if Jesus even cared. Have you ever done that? Here, God, where are you? And in verse 39, look at it. He says, peace, be still. Silence. And the storm ceased. So this morning in closing, do you have storms in your life, experiences, fear, and you need peace? This is a reminder, you can trust God. Regardless of the storms or the difficulties, keep shining, keep planning. That's what he left you here to do. And he wants to see if we will keep shining for his glory and if we will keep planting seeds, even when things are going crazy in our nation, even when things are going crazy at work and crazy around us, in whatever storm you're going through, and they take on so many different forms, don't they? Cancer is a terrible storm. Losing someone you love, that's a terrible storm to go through. Depression, discouragement, pain, unemployment, debt, sickness, conflict, failure, kid problems, car problems, church problems, work problems. That's a storm you may be going through. Just remember, God at any moment can say, peace be still. He will give you the peace in the middle of that storm. Trust him by believing his promises. So as we come to our time of invitation, before we take Lord's Supper, I want to encourage you to, again today, shine for his glory. Light your candle, shine your candle, reflect his glory, and plant those seeds faithfully, methodically, every day, sharing the word. And trust him. Would you pray with me? Commit afresh. I will shine. I will plant. I will trust. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I encourage you, in fact, do it this way. Oh, God, help me to shine for you. Help me to plant seeds today. Not, not worried about the, the, the harvest necessarily. Lord, we'll trust you with the harvest. Lord, help me to trust you. But remember, before you can shine and before you can plant, you need to receive the word. You need to receive the light. And that starts by entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to save your soul. Trust him as your personal Lord and Savior. And if you need someone to talk about that, come forward today. We'll pray with you. We'll talk to you. Very simple. In a sense, if it can be done in a prayer, something like this. Oh, God, I need you in my life. Forgive me of my sins. I'm lost. 
Please come into my life and save me. Shine your light into my heart. I receive it. Plant eternal life into my heart. I receive it. I trust you. Give him your heart. Christian, ask him for, ask him for help in shining for him, because sometimes we just don't shine very well, do we? Ask him for courage to plant those seeds. If your faith is a little bit small today, if you feel like you're on that boat getting rocked, the, the word for the wind in that text is, is a whirlwind. These were, these were seasoned sailors getting rocked. They were in fear for their lives. If there are things in your life that, are, that are, have, have you that out of sorts, trust the Lord today. Ask Him to help you. I do want to ask you also to make a commitment to participating in our Summer of Revival. Participate. We'll have in-home meetings you can go to. We have evangelists coming to start and to end the summer. Participate next weekend. Steve Freeman. Our Wednesday night focus revolves around this. Participate. If you've got to work or you're out of town, we understand that. But otherwise, why would you not be here? Why would you, why would you rob yourself of that blessing? I'm asking you, please, make a commitment to participating in this summer of revival. So Lord, we have so many things on our hearts, so many burdens today. We lay them down at your feet. Help us to shine for you like never before. Help us to faithfully go out and plant seed again this afternoon and every day. We trust you, Lord. We need you. We're not going to have revival unless you show up, so we pray that you would. And Lord, I pray that you'd soften our hearts so we would have fruitful hearts, receptive for revival, receptive for you to change us, to mold us, to change our church, to do something new, something you've never done before, something fresh. We ask for that. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to have your full sway in our lives and in our church. And now as we invite people to make decisions for Christ, I pray, dear God, that we would have soft hearts, that we would listen to your Holy Spirit, that we would respond. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you stand with me? If you need someone to pray with, come forward. We'll pray with you. If you want to pray at the altar, do that. If you want to join our church, if you want to come and request baptism, whatever's on your heart, you're invited to come.
hearts on our heart. Isn't that the whole point? He softens our heart. He changes our heart. And when he has a, the reason he's more concerned about our heart than anything else, well, it's because when he has our hearts, he has everything else. When he has our hearts, we're, we're, we're consumed with kingdom business instead of our own personal affairs and, and just surviving and getting by. Life has got to be about something more than that. It's about his kingdom. It's like a little seed that grows into something enormous. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you say that out loud with me? Until he comes. He's going to come. He's coming. And today we memorialize his death, resurrection, but we also celebrate the fact that he's coming. I said, do this as often. It doesn't tell us how often to do it, but as often as you do it, that's what we're to be thinking about when we take Lord's Supper. This is for any believer. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have received him into your life, then receive this ordinance. And Lord, we praise you and we do receive you. But Lord, we know that really individually, every person must receive you. So today, Lord, we pray that those who have not yet received you would, and that we would be busy planting seed all over our community, that those who desperately need you would find you. Thank you for your body broken, torn apart, brutalized, tortured, for us. Thank you for your blood shed to wash away our sins because we know, Lord, that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, there's no forgiveness. We thank you for your divine blood that washes away our sins. We thank you for that, that act of sacrifice on the cross. And today we celebrate it, we memorialize it, we remember it. We thank you for it.
said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for the cup that represents your blood spilt to wash away our sins. We say thank you. Lord, help us to keep short accounts of sin. We thank you for what you did to make salvation possible. The day we remember. disciples were terrified. It means they had a holy reverence, understanding that they were dealing with someone far more than a man. Not a normal man. God. Human flesh. But 
think about our lives, we think about what we do, how we live, it seems like we have a culture that has completely and totally, and, and, and even in church to some extent, has no fear for God. May that not be said of us. He's our Father. He loves us. But we revere Him. He's a great and awesome and loving and terrible and holy God who will deal with sin. And today we just say, thank you, God. I thank God that my sin was already dealt with on the cross. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Thank you for being here today. I hope you'll come back tonight. Thank you, deacons, for um, faithfully administering the Lord's Supper again. Thank God for our faithful deacons. And, um, God brought one of our deacons back here recently from some pretty serious surgery. And uh, Don is up and doing better, and I asked if he would just dismiss our service in prayer today.